Radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Good evening, Fade to Black. Today is Thursday, April 20th. Happy 420 Day, everybody out there. 2023, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And tonight, it is time travel. Time shifts. My favorite subject. Well, I thought last night was my favorite, or the night before that, or any show last week. Oh, no. We know it's time travel. And tonight, our guest is... Von Brashler. We're going to be discussing his book, Time Shifts. Uh, He's the author of many books, uh, several books on consciousness development, including Time Shifts, Manifesting Mysterious Messages from Beyond, all my favorite subjects. I have the feeling this is Von's first time on the show. I think uh, we've got a lot of uh, visiting with Von coming up in our future. His recent publication from Schiffer Books is Past Lives, the first in a series called Ancient Wisdom, and it's in a scroll format. He's a formal faculty member of the Omega Institute for Holistic Studies in Rhinebeck, New York, and currently lives on an island, as I let everybody know a few minutes ago, in the Pacific Northwest, and I would like to welcome for the first time to fade to black, Von Brashler. We have a we man, that was a, that was a nail biter, Von. <laughs> yes, yes. Good to join you, Jimmy. Thank it, you. Yeah, it, it's great to have you here. And, and this is uh, we need to start off with the first time guest disclaimer, Von. So let's get that out of the way. You know, it's a terms of service kind of thing. Which is, Vaughn, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're named as friends. There you go. You got to click accept. You got to (laughs) click. You got it. You got it. You know, uh, time travel, uh, and we are going to discuss just about every aspect of it tonight. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, But before we get started... I just want to let everybody know, uh, yes, I, I, I texted out, I tweeted out, I, I did all this, that uh, uh, tonight we were going to do an AMA because Vaughn's got a storm rolling through his island and uh, he's lost his internet and lost his power. And, you know, okay, everybody was like an AMA. Okay, Jimmy, we'll ride through that. But um, a, a few minutes before showtime, I'm sitting here working, letting everybody know we got a little change of schedule and speaking to Michelle, uh, you know, my producer, about rescheduling and stuff. And then Vaughn just pops up. Burp! <laughs> I was like, oh, I guess, I guess we're doing the show. And I found out that... You live um, up in that crazy chain of islands uh, between Seattle and and Canada. You know, I guess you could call it, uh, well, yeah, uh, Port Angeles is kind of like the last city up there. Uh, And the next city past that's like Victoria, right? Uh, But between that, most people don't know, there are hundreds of islands. Hundreds. There are over 200 islands, maybe 300. Some are very small. Mostly aren't habited, inhabited, but I'm I'm on uh, one of the uh, well, medium-sized ones, and 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 they're called the San Juan Islands. And 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 connected by it's got to be I I I, I counted one time and ended up losing count. Yeah. It's got to be a, hundreds of bridges, right? It's, it's just like hundreds, one after another, hundreds and hundreds, yeah. It's Absolutely. such a beautiful drive. It's such uh, an amazing part of the country. And that's where you're at. And when the weather comes in, Mother Nature lets you know who's boss, doesn't she? Absolutely, she does. You know, I look at these big trees that surround me, and I wonder which ones will come down. 
So sometimes in the morning I go and I talk to them. I say, you don't fall on me and I won't fall on you. Oh, man. I love trees. I love trees. That That's a whole show. We could do a whole show yeah. um, on trees and uh, the way uh, you remember the band Rush, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. And the song Trees uh, yeah. by them. And you go and you listen to the lyrics that Neil wrote for that and, and understand what's going on and where we are today in the science of trees. It's, yeah. it's the Rush song. It's, it's yeah. actually true. It sounds like science fiction fantasy. No, no, trees, trees are about as smart as they get. Yes, and they're social and they communicate and they assist each other. And there's so much that we didn't know about biology when I took it in school and nearly failed because I said, no matter what you do, play the right music for your, for your plants. And, and, and they were going to fail me on that, on that term paper. But, you know, now we know that they're very sensitive emotionally, that they have a consciousness that we can't begin to understand. Well, maybe if you've let, read The Secret Life of Plants, you'll understand it. But sure. People have not. I, um, uh, it was about two years ago. Uh, I, I watched a documentary series on uh, trees and their communities, right? Yeah. And I was living up in Northern California in the Redwoods uh, at the time, and I was fascinated with this. But one of the things that they pointed out, all of it was amazing, but, but, and you already know this, but maybe the audience has never heard this. I hadn't. That if a tree or a plant needs vitamins, a specific vitamin, yeah. they send out a little signal yeah. and the trees get together and through the root system, they send what that tree needs. Yeah. And that's, 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 that's insane. Yeah. It's just incredible. Yeah. It's, it, 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 so anyway, uh, like I said, we could do a whole whole show on trees. Uh, tonight it's time travel. And uh, to lay the groundwork um, on this, there it, it, and I, there's probably 50 different versions of time travel. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's going back to... Uh, some of the things that Einstein uh, started with in 1905, 07, 08, uh, you know, 1915, yep. and so forth. Yep. We have that. Yep. Um, and then we have the variations that come off of that. And right. then we have the 10,000 paradoxes that right. are right. In, in, involved with that. Um, when you think of time travel, what, 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 what is first for you and what are the most important uh, traditional versions of time travel? Well, I, I side with the, um, the Einstein theory, I guess. I, I see nothing wrong with it. And also, in addition to that, I, I, I know how he got to that because he was somewhat of a mystic. And he understood that, that, that the, there's, uh, he understood what we call the radiation field theory where radiation in the form of light energy descends to the earth, how it impacts all of life, how it sparks all of life, how it initializes life, um, how when it strikes you, it, it starts your day, so to speak. So, you know, time and place, space and time are interconnected, that, it, that we all perceive it differently based on our perception. I know that Einstein was a real occultist or, or a mystic because I know that he read the, uh, the Secret Doctrine written by Helena Blavatsky. And I know this because I know that his private copy of the Secret Doctrine uh, was donated by his niece to the Theosophical Library in eventually Adyar, California because he had made all these notations in the book and earmarked it and had it right on his desk where he worked. And when he died, she said, oh my gosh, maybe they want this book back. She just thought it was a book, right? right. And she said, well, it's kind of marked up, but my, my uncle really liked it. Who is your uncle? 
uh, Albert Einstein. You probably heard of, yes, we've heard of him. Well, they were fascinated, you know, that he'd earmarked all these things that describe how light and consciousness descend to the earth, which actually emanates probably from the Hindu concept of Shakti and Shiva, light and consciousness coming to the earth. Well, he said it all starts with light. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And with a guy like Einstein, when I say like Einstein, any great thinker, uh, physicist, scientist, inventor, you only got to give them the spark. Yeah. Right? That's all you got to do. And they can run with it. And in, I, I could see Blavatsky um, in inspiring him. And then all you have to do is is get the math to work and, and put a scientific mind behind it. That that That's pretty much all great inventions. But just bring up Star Trek, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, now, okay. We have time machines, H.G. Wells, right? That idea where you're going to step inside something or use something mechanical, punch in a date, and go. Uh, we have that. Uh, we have the physical side with not a time machine, but you just leave the earth at the speed of light or, or close to it, like right. the time, turn around and come back in your in the future. In some cases, uh, depending on how fast and how long you're gone, it could be 10,000 years, a million years in the future, right? So we have that. And then we have uh, 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 the mind and, and, and doing an astral type of time travel. There's a visual time travel, yes. uh, the glasses and, and things like that, where you're just a witness. Are all of those the same right are they all just as valid i think that there are diff there are differences and i don't discount that any of them would be possible uh the only one that i would discount is the idea of a machine that you could get in as much fun as it would be to get in a delorean cram garbage down it and go you know into the future i don't think that's going to happen i don't think hg wells time machine is going to happen i uh, i know people who've talked about the brain mind machine that could may, maybe move you you know there are devices time machines the the point is that something physical cannot move at the speed of light without turning into pure energy so then you have that problem but then you have the the you have the long history of what you call visualization or mind travel, where people who apparently do out-of-body travel, and that would include a lot of Eastern mystics, and I've studied them, and it would include a lot of Western mystics, like shamanic uh, vision quest um, uh, shamans who do uh, dream travel or spirit, spirit walkers, spirit walkers or dream walkers, and they travel and others, and they seem to actually move outside the body in a, in a trance-like state and go somewhere and come back. And, I, and I, I lump all of this together with remote viewing. Sure. Totally. And, and now the question, is it purely an astral travel or astral projection, or is it more? Is it more? I would suggest it's more. Then you have the people who actually will seem, seemingly bilocate. Or they'll be here, then you don't see them, and then they're somewhere else. So they seem to physically move, which would, would, would actually discredit the notion that something physical can't move through time since they'd be moving at the speed of, of light and then turn into pure energy, according to Professor Einstein. Now, I know, and I know you know, Jimmy, that there are good examples of people who have done that. I've done that. And I cannot explain to you exactly how it's done, but it's rare. And, and I don't think it's teachable. Whereas uh, out of body spirit uh, uh, time travel is teachable. So I've concentrated on that because I know people want to time travel. I want to time travel and I enjoy time traveling, but it's easier to do it 
out of body, although it can be done actually through bilocation or relocation, if you will. And all I can think of is thinking back of my own experience in the ones I've heard about and read about as far as the body bilocating or relocating is that there is at some point, I used to say there's a, a little black hole inside every one of our heads, but it's more than that. I think that we have the ability, we have the inherent ability to actually turn our bodies into energy and move somewhere and relocate. Now, it, it, I mean, I can't describe that other than I'm sure all of your guests have seen the TV show and the, and the movie Star Trek and they go into a machine and then it it, it takes all of their, their atoms and, and, and moves them somewhere else. And imagine if you could do that with your mind. And I think it's possible probably to do that with your mind. I don't generally talk about that when I'm interviewed about time travel because it's really hard to control. And there are very few cases that have ever been well-documented um, so that you could teach it. Why is it so damn romantic, right? I, we all fantasize about it. We all, yeah. Want, yeah. Wh whether it's to the future, to the past, past yeah. love uh you want you want to go back and and maybe get an a in algebra because you failed it like i did or you know whatever it is you, you know go back in time and be the best guitar player or it, it's it's just and it's been written about and dreamed about and yeah. handed down for millennia why is it so romantic well i guess i wrote my first of four books on time travel on that perfect timing looked at why people like to look as a progression of time always moving forward we we have this idea that we're always moving forward and progressing and it's it's been argued that really we don't have that much movement it's just in our heads you know it's like you know we don't have a continuity of movement we're like a lot of still shots Think back to like when we did like um, instant cameras, right? You know, you'd snapshot cameras and you point your little brownie camera or whatever, your Kodak, and you point it at something. Snap, snap. They were all individual snapshots. And then in our heads, we play them all together. And, and moreover, that's what, what our lives are. We're a series of moments or instants. And I'm going back to Einstein purposely here. He talked about instants. There are many, many instants, and every instant is powerful, and every instant is now. Moreover, there are multiple nows. There's a now that's in the future, and in the distant future, and in the past, and the distant past, and then there's the now that we call here and now. But we're only focused on the ground in front of us and, and what our eyes and ears and other five senses can physically detect that's the limitation of our three-dimensional world we are linear thinkers but we long to be more we long to have a progression of a never-ending life that goes on and on and on without ending and and i think that to, to your question jimmy i think that people are in love with the idea that the the journey of their life goes on forever. And if you believe in time travel, it absolutely does. It absolutely does. So that now when I look at like lucid dreaming and I look at past lives and I look at, you know, consciousness development and energy healing and, and, and I, moreover, I like to look at the, at the, uh, at the heroes, the arc of the hero's journey, because I think each one of us are living life that could be heroic unleashing a champion inside of us that every one of us is part of a never-ending story it just doesn't go for 70 80 90 years turn to black and that's that so you don't have to think oh i need to hop a ride to move into the future or into the past because you know my life is so boxed in it's so limited we have a sense of being limited and boxed in 
that frustrates people. Everybody, when I say everybody, I'm saying that loosely, but most fantasize about needing to go back and fix something. And if they went back and fixed that one little thing, then life would have been perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pose that question to you because okay. I'll, I'll tell you what my answer is. I wouldn't change a thing. No. That's me. What, what would you change, if anything? <sighs> so many things. But, you know, I think ultimately I'd be like you and say, no, l l leave it alone. Leave it leave alone. Because yeah. every, every step you took got you to where you are. That's you it. Know? That's exactly yeah. it. That's exactly it. If, if you change one little thing, right? The butterfly effect. Yeah. My children aren't born. Yeah. I don't want to change that. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? I, no, 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 no. I wouldn't change a thing. But I would like to go back and observe a, a few things. Yes. And, that's, and, the, that's it. That's the key. You want to go back to observe. I always enjoyed the old books of Carlos Castaneda. The because best. Because he talked about being a perfect observer, a perfect witness. And I thought, golly sakes, that's what we really are. We all are so obsessed with our own, um, you know, our own coiffure and our own image and our own perfection in the making. Um, get get over it and, and get out of, your, out of your way. Because we're really here as observers, every one of us. I think, I think that people forget that the real payoff is in observing and learning that that that's it because there is no perfection you can't go back and fix it you can't go back and fix it because you can't touch that you have no physical you have no traction back there you can't go back there and do it you can't go back with a gun and shoot hitler you can't go back and make up to the girl that you let get away you, none of this can happen you know you you would like to think so but in, in, in there, there would be some like energy exchange if you went back in the past and you can, you can, and you can observe these things. You might not be able to interact with them, but even, even if you could, even if you could, the, at best you would like, you would like give energy. You would give pure emotional conscious energy to that person or those people. And, and the benefit would come forward to you in this lifetime. So a lot of people I say, yeah, I, I hear from, they want to go back and they want to fix what make the, make, made them sick or made them weak in their current life. And you can go back and you can give energy to that person. You can hold their hand. You could comfort them. You know, they might not notice you, but, but you could do it. And there would be some benefit but it would come back to you right now. And the benefit is that you've, you've observed and you've absorbed the information because ultimately time is opportunity. It truly is. It truly is. Every time, um, and I pose this question, I've done, you know, thousands of shows mm -hmm. and I pose this question all the time with guests because, uh, I think it's it's valid, interesting, and fun. And so when I ask a guest, it doesn't matter their background, but if they could go back and tell, what would they want to see? If, you know what? How many times I've heard, like, the resurrection or Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Twice. I mean, you know, maybe three times. You know what? Everybody wants to see the pyramids get built, including me, by the way. It's yeah. uh, it's really strange. Uh, what would you like to observe if you could go back? I thought of a few things. Uh, one was I would like to watch Archimedes and study him. <laughs> I, I would like I would like to spend the day with Pythagoras if I could understand him. <laughs> I would I would like to go to a concert with Liszt and watch his huge fingers dance across the keyboard. Right, right, right. That What's would be fun. Wasn't it Archimedes uh, uh, when the Romans invaded, uh, they crashed down the front door of his house and caught him in the bathtub? Yeah. 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 I, I, I would like to see that scene. Um, and he said, Eureka. <laughs> <laughs> like Good answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Archimedes didn't reach for a sword. You know, in that case, math didn't 
wasn't really a good defense against a uh, you know a Roman centurion. But um, I, I jest, I, I kid, I kid. But yeah, yeah, Archimedes, him with the uh, Antikythera mechanism. How did how did he dream that thing up, and and how was that built? Uh, yeah, Socrates would be good too as well, though. Uh, you know. These are really geniuses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and just to observe them, I mean, it would be way over my head. But just to watch them for a day would be a treat. Man, I don't, hanging out with Elvis might be pretty cool, though. I mean. That might be cool. Yeah, yeah. But see, it, it's that romantic side of it, yeah. you know, and, and, and we can't get away from it. Okay, so now. We're laying the gla- or groundwork for some very important conversation that we're going to be having tonight. Because then there's this other aspect of time travel where I think it's accidental. Yeah. You walk through it. Yeah. You observe it. Yeah. Somebody else is time traveling, and you happen to be at the right place at the right time, and you have a WTF moment, right, where yeah. you don't yeah. understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, is that... Do you feel, and we can call that time slips or vortexes or whatever, we'll get into that, but do do you feel that those are examples of an accident from the other side, from the time travelers, or that they are actually time traveling and we are observing it? Well, Jimmy, I, I think that a lot of people time travel now and then accidentally, and they right. don't realize it. You know, I think it's possible to lie on your sofa and have a daydream and you have a flashback where you're somewhere else. And it's so real. It's so real. It's like a, it's like a, a, a lucid dream and it just pops into your head, you know, and you're like in your, in your, you're living a past life, perhaps. This happens to a lot of people. And, and moreover, people will stand up and they'll say, oh my gosh, he said, that was crazy. Where did that come from? It was, you know, they'll think it's delusional. It's, it's, uh, it's purely imaginative uh, that it was, um, you know, not real. And yet I think this happens to people all the time, you know, like deja vu moments happen to people all the time and they can't explain it. They can't explain it. So I've, you know, the last book I wrote was, was time shifts. And what I wanted to do was to show how many people actually do have a time slip where they'll just, and to answer your question, I think they do it unto themselves, but unwittingly, unwittingly, and and they'll be walking along and they'll find, I think is what is like a, you know, a vortex or, or a portal. And I, I tend to think that these are like energy tears in the earth. They're like energy, um, little areas that like i live in a place where you cannot use uh uh your um uh you can't tell which is north and which is south when you're sailing your your boat because there is a magnetic anomaly and i think there are a lot of people a lot of places where there are electromagnetic anomalies and 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 i don't know how they happen I have no idea how they happen. Somebody will figure it out. But, you know, p- there are places where these things happen a lot. I mean, consider the Bermuda Triangle. Happens a lot, you know. And and there are various people, in, and they're not all crazy, you know. A lot of them just have these experiences. They can't explain it. You know, and this happened to me when I was a young boy. They can't explain these experiences. So they say nothing about it to anybody you know, maybe forever or for a long, long time. And and I, I think that I think that time slips happen all the time to everyday people. What's the difference? What's the difference well, between a time shift and, yeah. a, and a time slip? Uh, well, I, I've chosen to look at the people who accidentally take a sideways slip into time as time slips that they, they, they had not planned it or programmed it. Whereas some people seem to be really good at setting up little shifts in time and they're able to actually uh, experience a shift in time um, by, by planning uh, with forethought so they're not accidental. 
but they're essentially the same. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you three short examples. I'm not going to get into the details because the stories are long and drawn out and quite frankly, boring. I've told them too many times, but um, here's some examples. I'm eight years old. True story. I'm out in front of our apartment in Chicago. I, I see something in the sky. I look up and I see the Hindenburg. This is 1970. Rigid air, not the Goodyear blimp, you know, a Zeppelin. And I chase it across the playground and I watch this thing for five minutes. Low, I see the dudes in the gondola, right? Count the engines. I find out later, a couple of years ago, as I'm doing research, that there haven't been any Zeppelins on planet Earth since the Hindenburg crash, right? Yeah. Anywhere. No, that's it, right? The rigid airships ended. Blimps, sure. Now, wait a minute. What did I see? Yeah. So is that a time slip? Are those time travelers? Or did I step into a vortex? Oh, by the way, my atmosphere around me didn't yeah. change. I wasn't back in 1937, right? Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you, that? yeah I, I think that there are time convergences that happen. In, in, and I've experienced some of that myself when I lived on Mount Hood in Oregon. I experienced time convergences where I would actually sometimes see pioneers you know, resting against their, their old wagons as they were coming over the mountains. I would see settlers, old settlers with old handmade pitchforks and shovels coming out of the barn. And it would almost seem that they would happen as, at a certain time of the day. Wow. It would happen at a certain time of the year, usually in the fall or late summer or toward dusk. And moreover, it happens to people like me and perhaps like you that are in a, a very quiet place and, and, and they're not, in, you know, they're not with other people. They're alone. It, they're very, um, they go inside themselves. They're, they experience a shift in consciousness. They get very quiet. They go deep within themselves and they experience a shift in consciousness. I think that there's something deep within us you can call it your spirit or your your inner self or your higher self, or you can call it your, your consciousness, if you will. But I think there's something deep within us that understands all of this. It understands the past. It understands the future. It understands you better than, than, you, than you think you do. And, and it, it knows all of this, and, and, and it actually will open up the opportunity to see this. Now, this explains a lot of things, this convergence of time. It could explain ghosts. It could explain aliens. It could explain how uh, civilizations of the past come forward to speak to us, or perhaps civilizations from the future come back to speak to us. I think that there are time convergences happening here and there all the time. I was eight years old, so I wasn't deep in consciousness. I was thinking about okay. making mud pies in the sandbox, right? But you, but you were very quiet, and you were all alone, right? Yeah, I was. Uh, uh, now, it was so interesting that you said that, and and then when you uh, spoke about your own experiences with the pioneers, right, in the covered wagon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a caller uh, ten years ago, and uh, she calls in open lines. And she tells a story just like that. Uh, she was traveling with her family, um, station wagon, right, 70s. And they pulled over at a rest stop uh, somewhere in Texas yeah. and picnic table. And so they're setting up for lunch. She wanders off. Yeah. And she comes up on this river, and there's this sign um, thing marking the spot in the river. And she's reading that and said, this is where the wagon trains would come across from the East coast as settlers heading to the West. Yeah. And she's, she's reading that. She looks across the river. She's a young girl. She looks across the river and there's a wagon train. Yeah. She sees dogs, kids playing fire, smoke, 
things, right? A wagon train, horses. Yeah. She runs back and she thinks she's seeing actors. Yeah. She runs back and says, You gotta see this, man. This they're doing this thing over here. It's it's amazing. And she goes back with and they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what what you experienced, right? Yeah, and, and I and I interviewed a number of people for time shifts that have similar experiences. You know, there's a fellow at, at uh, Rock Lake in Wisconsin, and there was a there was a, a boy that went to hear uh, Lincoln speak, and and, the, he, and then he Lincoln was really there, and then he was disappeared. Then he disappeared, and then he was the boy was told there was nobody here, disguised. And 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 acting as Lincoln, you know. I mean, it, it, these these things happen. These things happen to people, and generally, nobody believes them, or they or they find it so unbelievable that they themselves never tell the story. Yeah, I, you know my Hindenburg thing. Yeah, I, I debated uh, talking about that in public. I really did. You know. Yeah. Jimmy, that's the craziest thing. Man, that's just a bunch of BS. Yeah. It doesn't change my experience. No. And let me tell you something. Vaughn, when I did the Google search, this is all I did. Yeah. What? What? I, I thought it was the U.S. Navy or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. So I go, U.S. Navy, uh, Zeppelin, uh, Chicago, 1971. Uh, yeah. Just to see what was there. That's all. Hoping yeah. it was. The USS Los Angeles or whatever. Yeah. And I read when I read that, that there were no Zeppelins or rigid airships since 1938. Yeah. Uh, I anywhere in the world, any country, I sat back and went, okay, I, I've got an issue here. I've got to, I got, I've got to work through this. It was a very strange, surreal feeling because reading that didn't change my experience. No. And I think it's legitimate, too, in that these experiences happen to young people like you because you have no frame of reference. You have no you have you have no knowledge of how many Zeppelins were ever built, you know, for all you you know that they, they they're building them every day, you know. And, and so and so your, your mind's wide open. You know, you're you're a sponge. You see what you see. You your eyes are, are wide open to see what, what what's there, and and there's no there's no filter from uh, no cultural filter, or or no damper on anything that you're seeing. Okay, so future is real. We're we're living the future right now, right? Yeah, nanosecond by nanosecond, we are time travelers. That's right. We know, right? Here's the now, now, and oh, ah, we just time travel. That's right. But if the future is accessible, and certainly the deep future, yeah, we know that Einstein said, uh, going back to the past, that's a little more difficult, possible, maybe, but going to the future is easy. Yeah. Wouldn't the future have figured out time travel? And because if you and I jumped on a starship and and went out and we come back and Vaughn and Jimmy are 10,000 years in the future and we come back and we go, okay, man, we're from uh, 2023. Can you get us back? Yeah, sure we can. Yeah, we yeah. master time travel. And yeah. we come, what, you, you understand what I'm saying? Where, yeah. where, where is everybody? Well, I, I think that, I think it happens. I think that they're, there's every possibility that the aliens that we're seeing, yeah, uh, are, are are from the future, and and I I know that a lot of people have have reported like you know Aztecs from the past, you know, and I I I think that I think that it is possible that we're that we're not fully appreciating the the potential the potential we have. I think of it this way: that that the time is like is like a conveyor belt, and you can hop on any time and go anywhere you want, and then you hop off and you're, you're in a different place. But you can hop right back on, and eventually it'll take you back where you are, because ultimately time is circular. It it it, it goes not just in one direction, but it can curve back on itself. 
well, space is curved. It's got to be that way. Right. So, 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 I, I, I think that we only think of the here and now as, as, as the ground in front of us as being our limitation. We're living inside a box, basically. And we can't think beyond the box. And all, all we have to do is alter our perception of the limitations that are around us and see the possibility of being somewhere else and in another time. And when that happens, you're going to have the most lucid dreams you've ever had in your life. And they're mm -hmm. going to be profound. And they're going to take you into the past, into the future, and into alternate realities that you've never thought possible. Be because it's all possible. I'm going to ask you a couple of uh, kind of fundamental questions, but it's been things that have bothered me for a long time. I feel that there are some historical figures from the past that were time travelers. They saw the future. Oh, yeah. And they applied it. I think Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. 100% went yeah. to the future, saw some stuff, came back and, and did his best. Right? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. Right. Am I crazy for thinking? No, thoughtfully? no. I mean, how could he come up with this? You know, and, right. and St. Germain's another one. Yes, 100%. 100%. So these people, you know, all the time we're finding, not all the time, but occasionally we're finding artifacts, usually in the ocean, that we can't explain. They're so futuristic. There are metals and designs and cuttings and, and etchings that nobody can understand. Where'd they come from? Jimi Hendrix, time traveler. <laughs> he was way out there. Yeah, he was. Wasn't he? <laughs> Good Seattle but boy. He was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. I, think, I think that Hendrix guy. I think he was a time traveler. Um, now, what about some of the more famous cases? Uh, and then I want to get to uh, the ability uh, to practice some of this stuff. Um, but uh, what about John Teeter? Uh, John Teeter. Uh, oh, okay. I, I John Teeter. Me, yeah. Okay. I'll help you out here. Okay. John Teeter was a time traveler that appeared on the internet. Um, he originally sent Art Bella facts in 1999. Oh, yeah. And then he showed up on the Time Travel Institute's um, forum and he was on the Coast to Coast okay. forum. And he's he's posting photographs yeah. of his time machine. He's posting uh, yeah. schematics, yeah. Uh, uh, some very interesting things. And then he said, "Well, you know, uh, I'll answer any question." <laughs> sure. And he was he was, it was pretty elegant. I, I'm telling you, I believe that yeah. John Teeter was real. Yeah. But um, and then one day he did his last pose. He said, "Man, I got to go back." Yeah. And uh, he's from 2037. Yeah, that's not so far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you think about some of these uh, claims from historical time travelers? Da Vinci never said he was a time traveler, but we've got... No, no. Well, there have been, been some well-documented ones. Uh, there was one in... Uh, uh, there were the three cadets in uh, Kersey, and, and that, that was studied for years and years and years of the three boys that went into an Anglo-Saxon village in the Middle Ages. And then when they went back, it wasn't that way. But they described it in great detail the way it actually was in the 15th century, you know. And and um, there's Rudolf Fence, of course, you know. He was a man who, uh, who uh, was all dressed up real, like a real dandy, you know, a high hat and a, mu a mustache and... And, and he was from Philadelphia, but suddenly he found himself uh, on the streets of New York in 1950, and he's hit by a car, and everything in his identification in, indicated he he lived in an earlier time. And that was well documented, you know. Um, let's see, there was uh, there were the uh, oh, the case, of course, of. Uh, uh, Oh, uh, Air Air Marshal uh, Victor Goddard. Uh, he was uh, 
uh, in the British Royal Air Force in 1935, and he flew over Edinburgh Airfield. Yeah, a storm had, had passed over, and he's looking down at these planes, and they're the wrong color, and they're the wrong shape, and the ground crew is wearing, is wearing you know, blue overalls, and none of this makes any sense. And he goes back and he files a report. You know what I like about these is that they and they end up in reports. You know they're they're documented. You know, and uh, you know there's a whole a lot of cases from England. Oh my goodness, Liverpool! So many cases of people who well, there was a cop that chased a, a robber down a, a, an alleyway, and the man disappears in front of his eyes, and the robber suddenly reappears and he said get me out of here get me out of here and and then the, she sits him down and takes a statement it's a station house and the man says i went down there and there were these old shops and i looked at the dates on the newspaper and it was not not today's date it was much much earlier you know so these are like good stories you know um do you remember uh i think his name was norquist the guy from sweden that yeah yeah, repaired his uh, his kitchen sink. Yeah, and yeah. goes seventy years in the future and and meets him himself. Yeah, and, and is able to take a picture, and they have the same tattoo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, this makes perfect sense. I think, I think it would be possible to go into the future and see yourself. I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. You know, people who do prophetic dreaming, they do exactly that. You know, they they go and they they see themselves in the future, and they 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 have vivid uh, accounts of what they've seen in their future uh, life lifetime, and 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 it becomes part of their living reality. You know, and they come back and they they talk about it. We used to call them prophets. <laughs> now we call them people with prophetic dreams, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, okay. Uh, two quick questions, and then when we come back after the break, uh, I, I, I want to do uh, the deep dive into the book. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, deja vu, if, yeah. if we want scientific proof, yeah, we can't measure deja vu, yeah. but I think every scientist, every physicist, yeah, every religious scholar, every atheist, it doesn't matter. No, everybody's had a deja vu. Everybody, and you can't you can't argue that. I, I do like some of the skeptics and debunkers' uh, explanations of it. I don't buy any of it because it's just they're trying to uh, uh, calm their own nerves, right? <laughs> because it's but uh, I have deja vus all the time. Is that time travel? Uh, that absolutely indicates time travel because if you cannot come up with a uh, a mental, physical memory of something or someone as in your past, in this lifetime, well, then what could it be? You know, usually those things will happen and, and the two people will stand there and say, I, I've met you before or, or I've been here before. And they say, well, now let's, let's, let's think how this could happen. You know, where have you taken vacations? Where do you go to school? You know, who do you know? What movies have you seen? What books and magazines have you read? And then if you get down to it, there's just no explanation. There's nothing in your memory banks in this lifetime. Well, then it's a memory of another lifetime. So, when, I, yeah, I think they're true. Yeah. When, when you hear, I mean, my, my typical deja vu, um, and it happens all the time, I will hear in my mind, the word for word, the conversation that's about to happen. Yeah, that's and another I'll one. Back and I'll just, well, I'll see what's going on, and I'll hear it go back and forth, and I just enjoy the moment. I don't yeah. freak out. Oh man, I'm having a deja vu. And announce it to the world, but I know at that point, either somebody's read my book of the future of my life uh -huh. and is reciting it back in my mind. Possibility. I used to think that a lot, actually, or there's <laughs> something else to it. Yeah, but that doesn't change the experience. The experience is real. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's that's the other thing. People, you see somebody and you 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 know you know them, and they know you, 
or or you 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 see something that you've seen or a, a, a setting a location you say i've been in this room or i've been in this place before and then the other common thing is exactly what you say here jimmy is that you've heard this whole conversation and you know what's going to happen next because time is looped you know we're going through this whole thing over and over and this is this is this is understandable because you know the way i'll just throw this karma thing at you I, th I think that I think that you know you go through so many experiences that you're supposed to take in and learn from and, and you're, we're programmed this way. Uh, I, I, there's no outside source. You, you, we're self-programmed. We, we want to do this. We want to have these experiences and we're looking for them and we go through life looking for them and then they keep happening. So Typically, things will happen in like maybe threes, you know. These things will happen maybe slightly different each time, but it happens again and again and again. So you have like the same conversation or you have the same encounter or the same experience. I can't believe the whole thing happened again. I can't believe we're having this conversation. And you say, we've never had this conversation before. But you see, you know, it's important for us to to keep rewinding it, you know, the time loop to experience the things that we need to experience. Once again, time is experience. It's an opportunity. Well, and what about, what about the Mandela effect? Yeah. Now, okay. I'm, I'm glad you reacted like that because it feels to me. No. Okay. I want your opinion. What do you think is going on there? Well, part of me th thinks about, you know, like urban legends and how people will start to say something and say, oh, yeah. And then, you know, we all tend to think of things we've seen in the past in a certain way because it hits us a certain way. But moreover, I think it, it's this, that group thought takes over and we collectively change the event through group effort. So if people want to think of something happening in a certain way or that someone died or someone didn't die or something happened to someone in a certain manner, well, then well, collectively we do this. And then so it, it, this is the way a lot of things get changed, you know, is just group dynamics. And it, it's not, it happens on a very subtle level through our consciousness, group thought is very, very powerful. Group songs, group anthems, group mantras, group chanting, group prayers, group thought. It's but that very, does, very powerful. That, yeah, it is, 100%. But that doesn't explain everything. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. I had, um, I had a, a series of phone calls and emails after... Uh, first discussing the Mandela effect many, many years ago. Yeah. And my thing was the original shuttle disaster. Oh, yeah. And so I'm not going to get into that. But what I did get was one email after another saying, for example, I was in fourth grade science class that morning and they rolled in the TV and we were watching it in the fourth grade, but in the fourth grade, uh, that was, you know, 1984. Yeah. You know, it was in the fourth grade. I, I was in the third grade. It was 1986. Yeah. I, I know what class I was in, what teacher and the TV. And it wasn't 1985. Right. Dozens of emails like that one after another. Yeah. And that's not group thought. No, that, that's no. crazy town. And I don't have a way to explain that. Yeah. Well, I had a, a thing with the Challenger explosion. Um, I wasn't really conscious of it when it happened. But then later on, I lived in New Hampshire. And years after it happened, I saw it on television happening live. Oh. And, it, and someone said, I just saw the Challenger go up. And this one lovely school teacher from just down the road here in this town in New Hampshire, went up in a ball of flames because the whole Challenger exploded. Uh, on, on, you know, it, it, 
the O rings. What was the O rings failed and it went up and it didn't. Right, right. It didn't. It, it didn't. It didn't go very far before it exploded. And someone said, "Well, that happened years ago, Vaughn." I said, "No, it just happened." So, so I mean, we all perceive time differently, don't we? And how do we explain that? Uh, it, 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 you would think that with uh, with the cell phones that we have today and the internet and watches, clocks are everywhere, that our bodies would have adjusted to the tempo of the second, right? And that we would all experience time the same. Can't be further from the truth. We always can't, no, it can't time. be can't be further from the truth. Uh, Einstein told though the story of a. Uh, of a of a person sitting on a stove and experiencing time very differently from someone sitting there back in well, Einstein's days in the 30 watching Marilyn Monroe walk across the street the time would would pass differently and it does you know when you're in an accident in in an accident time passes very very slowly and you're having a wonderful experience i mean when you're in an accident time time is very different every second seems like huge but but when you're having a wonderful time, it just all melts away, doesn't it? It certainly does. Yeah, it, it is a very different thing. But I think it's a beautiful thing because if we were all like having experiences simultaneously and experiencing things uh, equally, you know, uh, simultaneously together in the same manner, well, then we wouldn't have much differentiation. And I think the beautiful thing is that, that you're – you're going to come up with a different outcome at the end of this physical life that I will, based on what you've seen. What are your thoughts on Al Bielik? Al Bielik, uh, the Montauk Project, the Philadelphia Experiment. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the Philadelphia ex uh, Experiment, the, the, the Navy was actually trying at that time to, to uh, find a way to make a ship invisible. <laughs> invisible so, the radar. In, invisible, yeah. yeah. So they so 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 uh and, and the ship wasn't exactly the Philadelphia, but it was tied up next to the Philadelphia. And I think this is a case of like urban legend, right? So so it, it was it was somewhat successful and all anybody saw was the Philadelphia, you know, and then the Philadelphia was somewhere else. But there was a, a very elaborate uh, Navy plan to uh, make something disappear, I think, which is which is half the, the magical trick in time travel. Yeah, I think um, the original versions of it is uh, they were trying to, like, degauss a ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So which is extremely crazy voltage yeah. uh, with the old t TV sets, two TVs. Right. If you took the back off, right. you would see there was a wire that went around it. That was a degaussing uh, right. wire yeah. that kept the TV set degaussed. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. You touch that thing. That's a bad experience right there. So ah. they, they tried to degauss an entire ship, not to make it disappear. Yeah, but to make the metal neutral, so it yeah. would be invisible to radar. Yeah, and so <laughs> just it's just a bad idea from the word go, if you ask me. But anyway, they flipped the switch, and the next thing you know, you got a little time travel going on. You got guys yeah. that were melted into walls, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it, there's just no explaining it. You know, I was also thinking of the um, some of the black arts black ops that our own government has done and this is pretty darn close i think but you know the idea of 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 of, of using people with with psychic skills to change uh to analyze radar and 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 relocate things on a radar scope you know i i talked with with one fellow i can't say his name but he was for years working in that and um and you know they they would ask them not only to to make them to 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 make them move on the radar but disappear from the radar and the result was that the ships would tend to disappear you know and and um 
you know, Istok Bentov, you know, was involved in that sort of thing. And he just disappeared. He just disappeared himself because he was so deep into the program. I think there is a, there is a lot of abilities that people have to move things through space and time that would have to be come down in the, in the, in the, in the final analysis as uh, I don't want to say mental powers, but powers in, in inner, inner powers that people have. Because I, th oh, I think they, they have nothing to do with your, with your physical mind but they have everything to do with, with, with your, your higher powers as, 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 as someone who occupies the body, you know, it, it is, they're, they're, they're hidden, they're hidden powers within each, each one of us. Stay right there. Our guest tonight, Von Brashler, we are discussing time shifts, his new book, his latest book and time travel. I'm Jimmy Church. We'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. This is Jimmy Church, and I want to introduce you to Life Waves X39 Stem Cell Activation Patch, which has totally transformed my health, my sleep, brain, and my eyes. I no longer need reading glasses. X39 is a true breakthrough in regenerative science. Using light, X39's patented age reversal technology is clinically proven to signal the activation of younger stem cells, accelerating the body's natural healing process. X39 promotes restoration and rejuvenation, bringing the life-changing benefits that I've experienced. By naturally elevating a master signaling peptide in the body, X39 boosts vitality, health and wellness, and resets 4,000 genes to a younger, healthier state. It's one patch, once a day, and you can turn back time with X39. Just go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's works with an X. HealingWorksNow.com. Hey, everybody. It's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a lifetime achievement award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there for Bidden Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black Blend, the Game Changer Blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. And uh, our guest tonight is Von Brashler, and we're discussing his uh, latest book, Time Shifts, and we're talking about time travel. And as you can see, I wish I could time travel back about a week uh, when I still have my voice. It's getting better, though. Yeah, Von, I lost, uh, I went on a cruise. I was gone for seven days, and I did nothing but yell and party last week uh for seven days and i haven't got my voice back yet. oh wow yeah, yeah. 
but uh, I'll, I'll be fine. Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about the book, um, but you had mentioned uh, earlier in the show that you've time traveled and you've experienced this. Uh, can you walk me through? Yeah. Uh, let's see. My cat is taking over the, the broadcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, my, I've had these experiences all my life, and I, I, I guess it really is what started me off on this whole thing. I mean, I never really intended to write any books on time travel or any of these related subjects, but when I was 11 years old, I had an experience where, where I, I, I traveled, you know, and it, 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 I was just this kid in the neighborhood. And I decided one day I was going to ride on the, the berry bus and go out to the berry fields and all my friends, they would ride on this. We all had this idea. We were going to go out to the berry fields and this old converted school bus, yellow bus. And um, we had, we ended up going about 20 miles out of town. And my plan was basically just to go out there and eat berries and swim in the river. <laughs> that's all I wanted to do. And that's pretty much what I did. And on about the third day, maybe the fourth day, I, I was just full of berries. And I went down there and I started swimming in the river and I got really, really sick. And I went and I told the bus driver, I need to go home. I'm really sick. And he said, what's wrong? He said, well, you just you just have a stomach ache. Now, when people are very sick, sometimes they just have the sense that, you know, they're really in danger. And uh, and that's the way I felt. I, t I tried to convince the, the, the owner of the berry field to move me out home. Now, I didn't know exactly where I was. I was a silly kid that didn't pay any attention to the direction the bus went i just knew that we drove for uh i don't know close to an hour to get there and i figured i was 20 miles from home and i looked out and i saw that we drove over a, a railroad crossing to uh, as we entered the berry field now it occurred to me that uh there would be a railroad that would go right in front of my house and i just follow that railroad just walk up the railroad and i'd be home in no time now, I didn't know exactly which way this railroad track went, what, what switchbacks there would be or anything. And I told my friends I was going to do that. And they thought I was crazy. Well, I started down the road and I looked back and I waved. And then I, I went around a corner and there were all these, these uh, sticker bushes. And then there, I couldn't see them anymore. So I, I, I looked ahead at the railroad tracks that I was walking on and I I remember taking one giant step forward and then everything went black. And the next thing I knew, it was turn, turning dark and I was standing in front of my house. And I thought, wow, how'd that happen? But I was sick, so I just stepped down from the railroad tracks. I remember the tracks were much elevated from street level. So I had to actually step down from the tracks. I remember that. And then I went into the front door and I plopped down on my mother's bed and waited for her to come. And, and I said, I'm very sick. You have to call a doctor. Well, we did. And uh, we got to the hospital just as my appendix were bursting. Now, I see. I, it seems that I traveled 20 some miles and I did it in the blink of an eye. And, and, and I started out, it was about one. When I got home, it was dusk. So I'd say it was about 8.39. I don't remember walking, any of that. And so I just, I totally forgot about that for a long time. I tried really hard not to think about it. I said, well, I'm really happy it happened. And I told myself that an angel had picked me up and carried me. And I could remember no such thing ever happening, which would be nice, but I don't think I, I would remember if an angel picked me up and carried me. And it's like I just blacked out and then I was somewhere else. So the next year, I was in the backyard and I looked out at the front yard 
and I had this flashback of the whole incident happening again. And I had to admit to myself, then and there, that the railroad did not stop anywhere near my house. Never did. Never, never did. In fact, it was miles from my house. So that was a totally erroneous con you know, thought on my part. And the odd thing is that two years later, we moved to uh, north of there. And in fact, the railroad did pass in front of our house. So, you know, I told nobody about that story, you know, because I couldn't make sense of it. So I wasn't going to tell it to anybody. I just said I got home. I got home in the nick of time. And, um, and thank goodness I did because I was very, very sick, you know. But I couldn't explain it. Never could. And then, I, and then years later, I started having more encounters of, of a similar nature. And when I lived in, uh, in, in Oregon, and uh, uh, there would be like huge parts of the day I couldn't account for. I remember walking down the street one day, um, and, uh, and I worked for the newspaper. And I was starting down one end of town and walking. And then I remember everything went black. And then suddenly it was at the other end of town. And I didn't remember crossing intersections or anything. You know, and I had another experience where I was developing film. And the whole room just kind of changed in front of me. Like there was no building there. And um, then I came back and I didn't know how much time had actually transpired. So... I didn't know how, how, if I'd overexposed or underexposed my film. And so I kept having these experiences off and on all the time. And then I started running into other people. They would tell me their stories and they would say, oh, you must think I'm crazy. And I said, you know, really, I don't. <laughs> I can kind of relate. And then I found out that a lot of people have these odd things happening to them, but they don't want to talk about it. I I I had said uh, I was try I was trying to avoid being you know philosophical or you know some deep existential influence right I I, I didn't want to go there with everybody but yeah. I, I said everybody has had a crazy experience that they've put in a box on the shelf. Yeah. And you've forgotten about it. Yeah. But if you go back and you just think and just just take it back and go, wait a minute, there there was that one time. That's right. That did happen. But we don't have people to talk to about it. And a lot of times it's very fleeting, right? It's very quick. Yeah. And it, it just comes and goes. And then life gets in the way. Yeah. And you just you just shelve it, don't you? I think a lot of these experiences happen too when you're going through an ac an accident or an emergency, uh, and you you have to think very quickly, you know, and you we you somehow find a way to slow down time. And what I've noticed through the years um, is that if I really work at it, I can slow down time, uh, but I'm only slowing it down for me it's my perception of it you see and i can slow it down um and i can make like sometimes if i have like only like 27 minutes and i have like two hours and 70 minutes of work and i'm thinking there's no way it can be done and i said well i'm going to slow down time and i do it you know and i can and i can sometimes recreate this whole you know scenario because i've done it before and then, you know, you could also shrink timing so it goes, so it just seems to go, it stretches. You can stretch it out and it's longer and longer and longer. I remember once driving across Montana in a blizzard and I had no gas in my tank, but it was early morning hours. And this is before you could drive up any time of the day or night, put in your credit card. If they, if the gas station wasn't open, you didn't get gas. That's right. well, I was, I was in a, I was in a, in a Bronco and I was driving across Montana, all of Montana, uh, in, in a snowstorm. And I started about, I don't know, quarter to three. And, uh, you know, 
I kept thinking like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to make it, you know, it said empty. And I said, no, you're going to make it. I said, you are going to be from here to there. And it's going to happen so quickly. And, and, and you have everything you need. And somehow I did that. You know, I got, I got, I got to the other side of Montana and, uh, and the gas tank still said empty. And, you know, I, I know that gas tank worked. <laughs> I know it worked. I know it worked. But on that day, it seemed to stretch. So I don't know if that's a good example of stretching time or not. But I've also made time go slow and fast. I mean, it's really good in moments when you need it to go slow, like when you're in an accident. So well, I remember a time when I was working for another newspaper and I had a little a uh, little sports car. And I thought I could go any speed I want and make hairpin turns. Now that works if you, unless you're coming downhill and you, and you land into a pile of water and you have to make a 90 degree turn, then it's really, really hard. So I, I, I did that. I came straight down this hill and I saw that since it had rained the night before, all the water had gone down the hill and settled at the bottom of the hill in a puddle and I wasn't going to make the turn. So I could either go over the embankment, over the cliff, or just smash into the uh, the barrier, or try to turn and crash. And and I thought of all these things. And it, it it's odd because I must have had about less than two seconds to think of all these things. But I thought of all many, many scenarios until I, I stumbled upon the only thing that would work, you know. And, and before I got to that, I thought of like three, four, five other things. And it's like, how could I think of all these things so quickly? But very often when people are in an emergency or an accident, you know, they have amazing uh, powers. Sometimes they can lift buildings, you know, or, or cars off of children. And sometimes they could just slow down time. I think that athletes slow down time. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Kobe's shooting three pointers. Yeah. They, 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 they make, they make the basket not, look big. That's or they, not real time to them. Yeah. No. Or, or they'll, they're the, the best baseball hitters, the best batters. They will tell you if you interview them. And I, you know, I used to be a sports reporter. The ball is going, coming to them at over a hundred miles an hour. But they can slow it down in their mind's eye so that they can see the actual uh, 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 stitching on the ball. Stitching, rotation. Yeah. Uh, that pitch, they, instead of taking a quarter of a second. Yeah, they can tell which way the ball is spinning. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, how do they do that? It's because they slow down time in their mind's eye, which, again, is the idea that we how we perceive time individually is how we experience time. Golfers, yeah. golfers, that that they are in a slow mo. They are living. They have uh, they have the anatomy of like a fly. Yeah, yeah. There was a guy on yes, you know, two days ago. He hit a hole in one in a tournament, and they I televised saw. it. It was incredible. How could you do that? You think of, of of everything you need to think of to do that, but he just. You can't say he was lucky because he was trying to put the ball in the hole. It's just amazing. Was that a car trip uh, across Montana? Was that from the forward in your book? Uh, no, that was another uh, car trip by the couple that, that got lost in time, a uh, trip from Chicago to New Mexico. What happened? And, oh, they, well, they, uh, there was a detour halfway there. And they took the detour and got off the main highway. And then they, they would see these signs for these little towns. And every time they'd pull in there, you know, they'd see the same thing. There would be a woman pushing a baby buggy. There would be like a, a gazebo in a town square. There would be um, uh, like a, a cafe. There would be an old church. Um they, they, and, and, and then no, nothing seemed to be moving. Everything seemed like static, like the woman with the baby buggy never really moved it. The, the kids playing in the park didn't seem to move. They were just like frozen in time. 
And they said, this is creepy. So they get back on the main road and they go, they go down the road. They say, well, let's look at the next town. That was, that was weird. And they went to the next town. It was the same thing, except that the clock was like one hour, one hour, one hour later, you know, it was the same clock and the same woman with the baby buggy in the same park. And they, they did, they did this three times until they got beyond the, um, the, um, the detour, you know, and then, and then everything was normal, but there was just no explaining. Now I was interviewed in, in Australia and there were these two women that were sisters. They, they said, Oh my God, that happened to us in Australia. I said, well, tell me it was the same thing. They're driving in their car, you know, and they, they pulled off in this little town and it was just crazy. Nothing moved. You know, it was like the, the three, Navy cadets and Kersey, you know, it was a, a moment in time that never enough with, without motion, you know, they were like looking at a, a Norman Rockwell painting, you know, that was a still life. And, and then they got back on the road and the same thing happened again. In, in their case, it happened twice. And they said, we, we haven't talked about that, my sister and I, because we thought people would think we were daft. What do you think? And I said, you know, I've heard this story before. <laughs> so I'm thinking like, maybe you're not daft. Well, Plus I, the fact that they were together and they experienced it together, you know, gives some collaboration to the story. Now, as an adult, uh, what do you do now? Uh, now that you, uh, you, you've you got a general idea, right? How to get this done. What do you do now and and, and how do you get it done? Well, yeah, I'm I'm concentrating on on going to all of these, you know, time travel scenarios through lucid dreams and I program lucid dreams and I consciously set up dreams to go into the past or the future for very specific things. You know, it's kind of like, you know, like uh write down where you want to go tomorrow and how you want to spend your day. It's like you're planning out your vacation. So, you know, often I'll do this and I think that a lucid dream is is a wonderful opportunity to experience time shifts, and I think it can be done. It's through visualization. Take take me through the process. I'll do it tonight. Okay. So what the technique I've come up with for lucid dream programming is um, is 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 to get very quiet and and put your <coughs> put your body to rest, your physical body. And I do this through a series of self-hypnosis techniques. And the drill is to like focus on your feet and getting them very tired and numb and let them go, let them go to sleep. Then your legs and then your torso, then your midsection, your, your, your arms, your chest, your head, all the way up to your ears, your eyes, your eyebrow, even your hair. And then finally put your, your, your physical mind to rest, let it, rest with the assurance that it's going to be safe and it's going to be well protected and nothing is going to happen to it. And then you begin to go deep within yourself where you visualize a, a blank slate. Usually I'll just keep doing this until I see just nothing but blackness. And I tune out all internal and external thoughts as in meditation. And then and then when it gets totally black, then I start to draw things upon a, a tablet in front of me. And the tablet is something that I could draw on and I can put down there exactly where I want to go and what I want to see and what time period I want to visit. So if there's a period in the, in the past specifically I want to visit, then I'll, I'll include as many details as I think are important, such as what other persons would I want there? Is it a specific time? And then where is it? And then what experience do I want to have there? Or I could do this in the future, you know? And I, or I could go anywhere and do this. And I, I'm actually building, I'm building a storyboard of where I want to go. And this, this, and, and this is done through visualization. But, but it's also done by uh, an absence of words or, 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 or conscious, or how would I say, mental analytical thought. It is done by drawing pictures 
or painting pictures uh, upon this tablet by accessing my inner consciousness. So my consciousness then is developing a scenario of where it wants to go and what it wants to see. Uh, you're not uh, specifically um, uh, thinking of an exact date or year. You could do it, but but okay. I, I usually I'm thinking of an incident because I I'm I'm not I'm not going to pinpoint exactly the the minute and the hour and the in the day and the in the city and the street you know but just the situation and then and then once I've done this uh, then I, I I tuck it back into the, the deep recesses of my my consciousness, and I focus on leaving the body when the tablet reappears. And so, in short, I'm using visualization, um, uh, self-hypnosis, and then ultimately I'm using post-hypnosis uh, with a post-hypnotic suggestion that when when I do fall fall to sleep, that at that moment the tablet will come forward It'll appear in front of my mind's eye, and that automatically triggers me to leave my body. And all this has been set up and pre-programmed. And it's important to do this with harmony between your physical self and your inner self. In other words, your analytical brain can't consciously safeguard your well-being and, and, and protect you by saying, oh, no. Right. We're not going there. This might be dangerous. This, you know, danger, Will Robinson. So you, you have to, in order to do this, you have to have, you have to have permission to leave. And you need permission from your mind. So now in Hinduism, they call this the slayer is the slayer of the mind. But what I think what they want to say is, is that you have to reach, you have to convince the mind to let your inner higher consciousness or higher your other mind your spirit mind go you know so so when i do this um effectively i can do it for when i go to sleep at night it'll automatically trip when i go to sleep if i do it carefully methodically and don't miss any steps uh, and and it's important that you have the intent that you're going to do it you focused intent that you, you're going to do this I can also do this in a daydream. I don't have to be fully asleep. I could be reclining or, you know, meditating and do this just as easily. And I find this is what many mystics in the East do. There's a whole school of yogis called you know, Samadhi mystics. In, in Samadhi yoga, they train their young first to, ha to control their dreams, to have ex excellent experiences outside normal time and space. What if you yeah. don't come back? Yeah, what if you don't come back? So, I mean, <laughs> would that be so bad? I mean, it's like no more, no more bills in the mail. No, here's 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 my serious, I mean, uh, here's my what, serious what, answer. What happened? You want to come back? What happened to Vaughn? He's been like that for three months. You know, and <laughs> you don't want to be that guy. Yeah, yeah. I just I have a note like feed the cat if I don't get up. Okay. Yeah, right. Ready? Exactly. Here's a, here's a here's a list of uh, to dos. Yeah, but you know I think that that if you do this right, there's never going to be any concern because because you feel a karmic a, a, um, connection between your physical self and your spirit self. So your if your consciousness is anywhere outside your physical body. All it needs to do is think back to its physical presence uh, in, in a particular time and place, and you'll, you'll snap back with alarming speed. The, the only thing to worry about is really is how quickly you'll snap back. That can be alarming. The trick is, if I'm understanding you correctly, is you have to have an absolute quiet mind. You can't be thinking about your rent, your car payment, right? You can't be thinking about any. You have to have the quiet mind. You've got how, it. But how do you, how do you, I, 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 I have problems with that. 
And the way that I quiet my mind, because, Mm -hmm. man, I'm thinking about tomorrow's show. I'm thinking about what just happened tonight with Vaughn and how I asked the wrong questions. And you you know what I mean? (laughs) My mind is is going. And Mm -hmm. and if I don't quiet my mind, I won't go to sleep. I'll I'll, I'll be an insomniac. Well, that's the key. You've got to quiet your mind or you can't you can't rest, you know, and you and if you don't. if you don't seriously rest, you're not going to be able to have a lucid dream because what you're going to have is a fitful, angry dream where you're tossing and turning in your sleep. And you have those terrible nightmares where, well, you're frankly thinking of everything that, that you didn't resolve today, all the questions you couldn't resolve, all of the problems that are, are, are like heavy baggage on your back. You're thinking of, of, of everything that happens tomorrow and the uncertainty and the worries of, of what happens next. And so there are so many things going through your brain that you can't shut it down. And so it just keeps going. And so it keeps grinding and grinding away, even though you think you're resting and asleep your mind is still grinding and grinding it away. And, you know, you'll toss and you'll turn, you'll kick your legs and you'll roll in bed. And you have these fitful, fitful, absolutely horrible dreams of just, of, of going over unresolved questions that, that perplex you. No, those are not the dreams we're talking about. Right. The lucid dreams are something quite different. Now, the ancients, they actually did dream work where they would actually have dream temples in Mesopotamia and Assyria and Babylonia and onward to Egypt and even to Greece. They had dream temples where people would go and have dream encounters and people would set them up and and somebody would almost like a spa, they'd come to you and they'd help you, you know, achieve a a quiet place and, and, and still your mind so that you could have a meaningful dream and, and this is in a lot of traditions, you know, in the Buddhist tradition that today, even today, there is the tradition of, of dream yoga as a meaningful way of learning things. And, and, it, and in the Islamic faith as well, you know, so, so there are, are many examples throughout history of people who have used dreams to, uh, to reveal uh, insights of the past and the future. I have a sneeze coming on. Okay. You keep talking. Just, just. Oh, talk. okay. So, so I, I think it's really important that we do dream work, and 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 dream work is just actually mining the possibilities in your own dreams, and actually having meaningful dreams. And, and when I say lucid dreams, I mean insightful dreams, I mean vivid dreams, dreams where you actually have, uh, um, you you leave with, with a lot of information and a lot of ideas, and you're just so excited that you get up and you want to write it down in a, in a, in a diary. It, it, it's vivid now, and by the way, I didn't sneeze, so I'll give you the warning when it comes. When it, <laughs> okay. Great. But, okay. But astral, you're still in your body in a lucid dream. Yeah. Now, see, what I think of is, as far as time shifting and also lucid dreaming is that if you do it right, it's more than just astral traveling. Because, you know, astral is like your emotional body. It also it takes in, into consideration other energy bodies, which we all have in our causal body, our spiritual body, our, 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 our um, uh, uh, mental body, and taking all of that with you, except for your physical body, which lies there, <laughs> lies in state, you know, peaceful, quiet, r- at rest, and protected. So it's very important when you, when you have a dream like that, because you're going to be so out of it, that you are in a very safe, quiet place. Now, an example of this is in India, in Indonesia, when they had the big tsunami a few years back, and this hit Indonesia and southern India very hard. And in India, there were many um, teachers with uh, students in Samadhi mysticism, Samadhi yoga, who had um, progressed with their students to the point where they would leave their body 
for prolonged periods of exploration beyond time and space. And they worried when some of them were in their dream, lucid dream cycles, that what to do with them during the tsunami. Could they just pick them up and carry them? Should they leave them alone? Right. Should they, you know, what the, and, and some of them were gone for three days. And um, th wow. this is no exaggeration. You know, people can be gone in a, in a lucid dream if it's really well thought out a long, long time and be very safe there. But you have to you have to think about the safety part. You know, am I really in a safe room? You know, if there's a fire, will somebody come and get me? Right, you know? right, right. Yeah, right, that, that sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah, you don't want you don't want the police to show up, the fire department, and no. you're in your boxers. You know, no, with, no, with an eye mask on. Uh, yeah. You know, in a deep lucid dream. But do you ever get recognized? Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. So what, what happens is <clears throat> if you keep doing this long enough and uh, methodically, you will eventually uh, have some recognition of, of people you see there. And you'll see that unlike a Freudian dream, you're not just seeing yourself playing all the parts. You're actually encountering real people. And they're very, very likely people that are dreaming. <laughs> they're in the dreamscape with you. And I started having dreams where I would be dreaming and then, and then, other people would be in the same dream. I think one typical dream people have is that you're we're in a in a in a um, in a room, you know, called often the upper room, and that you're all like um, in a circle on the floor, and then a, a great teacher comes out and says something to you, and and that's a very common dream that people have called the upper room dream, and and I and I've had dreams where where I would encounter people and they. And they wouldn't seem to, they'd be kind of oblivious to everything around them. You know, like they didn't think that any of it was real, you know, because they were not not accustomed to having that kind of a, of a lucid dream. And I remember talking to one man and we were standing outside in the rain at, in the dark in a very specific time and place. And I said to him, you do realize you're dreaming, don't you? And he goes, oh. You're right. And he disappeared in front of my eyes. Of course he disappeared because he went back into his body, you know. So those, yeah, I mean, yeah, you I've do. often thought if, uh, <laughs> okay, I, I've often thought that the movie Inception was more of a documentary yeah. than it was science fiction. Yeah. Um, and, and I question that part of it, dreaming within a dream. Yeah. Right? yeah. What, what if you, what, what happens <laughs> then? And and it's it's I haven't done it, but I've often thought about that. And I think that the uh you, you know, going down one more layer, okay, let's get into that level. Yeah, and now we fall asleep again. <laughs> yeah, into another level of dreaming. Yeah. Do you do that? I haven't had that experience exactly, but but I, I do understand um how it could happen. Um I think that I think that when you're in, you're in a in a, a very a very impactful lucid dream and it's very intense uh, that you can return to that dream and and, and, and go deeper and deeper into the dream uh, and experience it on different levels and 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 prolong the experience. Um, but but as far as um, going, I think that many people think that when they dream, you know, they're they're no longer awake. And, and I would just put out to the folks out there listening that maybe it's the reverse is true. Maybe you're fully awake when you're dreaming. Well, do you, do, I think I want your, I can't wait to hear your response. I, I don't know what a dream actually is. I don't think we're using the right word. That's yeah. just the word that we have in our modern English vocabulary. Agreed. I think it's just another reality. I That's think you're right. I think you're right. And so the beauty of this is <laughs> if, if you get really good at shifting into these other realities into what we're calling your lucid dreams, which is kind of a silly title, but we'll keep using that term because people get it, um, that you can go into any alternate reality. 
not a not a specific one like you were five years old and you lived in the city and you here are these people and you're going to relive this experience you can do that you know but what's the point wouldn't you really rather explore alternate realities alternate worlds alternate universes alternate identities you know maybe you're going to find yourself living in a parallel world. You know, that's that's an interesting situation. And and frankly, I've I've been there and it's it's kind of like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I said, I think you're having more fun than I'm having. And I said, Well, yeah, I don't take myself so seriously here. You have these odd experiences like you're meeting somebody, you know, in a in a group where you're networking or you're on vacation, you're saying, Well, um, how do you like the weather here? You know, <laughs> Jeez. one of my favorite uh, time travel stories, and and there's so many uh, great ones out there. Um, but I, I think, and I could have this wrong. Um, I've I've heard it told so many different ways. Uh, two or three sisters are in France in 1930, and uh, they're visiting a palace. Yeah. They're going across the ground, sort of looking at the flowers, and they're doing this, and they get separated from their family, yeah. come over a hill, and there's a mansion that is there, yeah. and uh, there's a, a party going on, yeah. and and they notice that there's no cars, yeah. right? It, it's like horse and buggies and parasols. It, it didn't match yeah. where they were, and the the story it's because they they go back and they tell every hey man there's a party going on <laughs> yeah just, and and they go back and and the mansion was empty right yeah. okay yeah. so let's say they don't go back to their family yeah and they continue walking into that party yeah do they are are, are they invisible Right, right. Yeah, yeah. They're they're not noticed by the other people. Usually, they the other people are in are in their own world, their own time, and their own uh, you know their own reality, their own perception. So most often they will not see the other people. I mean, the other people will not see them. Is what I'm trying to say. You've heard this story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it comes from you know, and and it has real basis in fact, and it's a well documented uh, case of time travel, often called the gold standard. And it, it's two ladies from Oxford University. Oh, okay. It, they weren't it, sisters. It, no, well, no, they were colleagues. They were both professors, and they were they there were Charlotte Moberly, who ran a women's college at Oxford University, and her colleague. Uh, Eleanor Jordan, and they were visiting the Palace of Versailles, and this is shortly into the 20th century, and they found on the day they went that the Grand Trianon Garden was closed, and so they were doing so disappointed, but they wandered around, and they noticed it wasn't a, a, a busy day. The place was pretty much closed on the day they went, but they found a, a, little, a little garden that was actually open, and it was called the Petit Trianon. And they went inside and they went over a little bridge and there was a man in a the costume there and they walked right by him. And there were people all wearing elaborate costumes. And there was one woman who was seated and she had an, uh, a, an easel in front of her and she was painting a picture of the little garden. And she was very intent on doing this. And to the two women from Oxford, the whole thing seemed strangely out of time. Also, nobody seemed to recognize them or even acknowledge them. It's like they just wandered in and were invisible. And they thought th th these were actors or a costume yeah, party. Yeah, they thought it was a costume right. party. So right, these right. two ladies, they said, that was crazy. And they told people about it. And people said, well, I never heard anything like that. You know. So they returned several times. But it was never that the same way. Never, never again. It happened only once. And the women were like, like blown away by their experience. So they decided to publish their account about a decade after it happened. And they wrote this famous book called An Adventure. And then a, a new group had just been formed in London called the British Society for Psychical Research. 
and they investigated the reports of the women. And they found that there was actually a bridge where they said there was a bridge and that there had been garden parties with elaborate costumes back in time. And, and then they, and they found out that the time that they were describing was the time of Marie Antoinette, who actually was famous for having garden parties where everyone dressed in costumes. And uh, these were moral, these were organized by a poet they, that she knew called Robert Montague. And he loved having everybody dress in costume. And she would just love sitting out there during these garden parties and painting. And um, so they found out that this, this actually, that everything they reported was, was true. But, but there was no way the ladies could have known about the bridge. And they might have known about the costumes. But, you know, the bridge? No, nobody knew about the bridge because the bridge had been gone for a long, long time. And this little footbridge they described was not a very significant piece. Uh, what year uh, did the actual event take place? 1901. Oh, one. Okay. And they wrote the book in 1911? 1911, yes. Okay. And that's a very famous case. And there have been many uh, similar stories and, 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 and actually... Uh, recreations of, of what they've done as far as like dramatizations and stories about them. That's, it's, a, that's, a, it, good movie. that's a good movie. Well, well, it's especially when you have like two credible women, college professors, right. and, and they experience it together, you know, and, they, and their story never, ever changed, you know. So you have collaboration, you have authenticity, reliable sources, you know, and then they documented it. The, and then it, it was studied, and and what they reported was found to be true. Uh, did did it ever? Did the story itself ever change? No, no, no. Right. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> I was close. I've heard yeah. so many. I was close, um, um, but yeah, that's the. So it was. Vers I wrote everything down. It was Versailles. Versailles. And the book is called An Adventure. An Adventure. Right? Yeah. Nineteen eleven. Yeah, you know, it's like the 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 fence stir up Dr. Fence, you know, or the or uh Air Marshal Goddard. You know, these are like documented cases. They had some investigation behind them. There was a report, the government report, a follow-up investigation. There was some collaboration involved. Some uh some the the the, the people telling the stories were credible, you know. So who just, was who was um oh man I had other important stuff uh uh but for some reason what about the case of the Wall Street investor right he comes in and he does a bunch of trades he gets caught yeah. and then he gets bailed out of jail yeah. and then disappears yeah do you know that case I don't know that case. No. Okay. All right. Tell us. It's uh, a good one. Well, I don't have the specifics in front of me. I've, I've, I've read about it so many times. This is a modern case. Um, and uh, so he, he comes in. He trades. He trades, I think, for about a month. Wow. 30 days. But um, and, and, in a modern sense right it is i, I want to say 1980 85 this went down yeah. um uh but his trades were 100 percent accurate so he gets investigated yeah. and he turns around and and tells the feds he it's a federal arrest tells the feds hey man i'm from the future yeah yeah <laughs> you know, i'm from the yeah. future and and then yeah. I think I think he had his bail set. They had his name, they had his address and, and everything else. And then I think that it turned out that there was no historical record for him anywhere. Yeah. Um but anyway, disappeared. Yeah. Go on. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I, th I think that it it's probably unlikely that he actually realized any benefit from it because then he disappeared. Um 
it was probably in a sense um well isn't that not, the, not it, real if, if you're a time traveler yeah you don't want to get caught right no. you don't want to get caught you don't want to get caught so you've got to dress in the period right yeah well what was most people that successfully travel in time in in body you know they 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 do not have like hands that can hold things or pens that can write checks or they don't have bank accounts you know so there are there certain things like you're you're just basically a a, a a traveler just passing through you know and and to, to think that you could actually you could actually change history or 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 game the system by by having some you know physical bearing uh on the situation um uh, seems unlikely but 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 we we know we know that people have done it you know there have been there have been reported cases you know um there is there is you know in hinduism there's the principle that you can i'm not sure i'm going to say this quite right but there there is a sutra where you can actually you can actually study something long enough that it disappears and the idea is that if you concentrate long enough on 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 your personality your your person you can disappear you know and and then and conversely you could actually you can actually focus on something so so that it's paramount and, and larger than life which would be true of yourself you know and i think that this is kind of a key to how people become invisible how they bilocate how they relocate and how they move through time you know I think that there is a, a way to do this, and it's it's and I think it 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 I have to believe that it it is dependent on a person's ability to achieve a high level of conscious development. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna leave you with uh, this very simple question: best time travel movie. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I'm asking you, what's what's the oh, oh oh right now? Oh, oh okay, oh, okay. I, I, mean, I mean, nobody cares about my opinion, Vaughn. They're here for yours. Well, I I'm a romantic, so I have to say, somewhere in time was so beautiful. Oh, so good. It was so beautiful, and 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 Jane Seymour today it seems timeless when you look at her because you remember that movie, you know, and you think of of uh, what happened to uh, uh, what Christopher what was his name, uh, the the actor who played the other part and died, yeah, uh, right, right, spinal injury from riding a horse, and you think like, oh, he'll Chris forever, Reeves. Chris Christopher Reeves, he'll always be that young person in the movie. Because it was timeless, you know, it was absolutely timeless. It was, it was a beautifully done story, and I, I have to think that wh whoever wrote that story had put a lot of thought into it, because it seems to me that it's kind of legit. Oh man, and you just cry like a little baby in that man, and yeah. and and here's the thing with that. That's the, one of the best time travel movies, but it's not Jane Seymour's best movie. Ooh. Jane's best movie I happened to watch last night. Ooh. Head Office with Judge Reinhold, 1985. Oh, wow. Jane Seymour. Oh man. <sighs> was there was there when you think of Hollywood, you know, glamour? Yeah. The, Jane Seymour. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. Here you go. You ready? Yes. I have this. Out of time. I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's the license plate from Back to the Future. That is it? That yeah. is it? The very right. one? Right there. With the wow. With well, the the yeah. You know, Back to the Future was a very good one, too. You know, and it, it, it made people think about it a lot. You know? I, I, I love it. But um, in my opinion, and I watch... <laughs> Amazon, Netflix, now, 
with their AI engine, I've got my own subcategory. It pops up right there, time travel movies. Yeah. <laughs> I watch them so often. But there was a movie that was made for uh, um, seven grand. It's called Primer. Ooh. <sighs> Write that down. Write it down. Write it down. Primer. As far as uh, time travel movie, it, it is excellent. Seven grand. These kids, a couple of brothers, made it with their parents' credit card at their parents' house. Wow. Top notch. Primer. Wow. Wow. Excellent. Hey, Vaughn, thank you so much. I, I look forward to the next time that I have you on the show. And it can we do can we do a night of consciousness? That's sure. it. Sure. Just consciousness. Yeah. Great. I, I know you've got something to say about consciousness. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, the whole new series we have, uh, ancient wisdom series, is right. going to be all on consciousness, and we're going to put them in scrolls because I don't, I don't know if anything is going to survive. I don't know where this is all ending up. I mean, ultimately, it's going to, it's all going to, you know, be fine. But we're going to go through a dark period, I'm afraid, and things are going to be buried in the earth just to be kept alive. <sighs> I'm going to have to bury some guitars. <laughs> Don't lose the guitars. They'll be digging them up and say, what were they? What, what, say, what was it? This is string theory. String theory, yes. Yeah, yes. String theory. String theory. <laughs> sure. Von Brashler, a perfect conversation tonight. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank and you. I know you're dealing with the weather up there. I just hope you guys stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Great. Take care. Perfect show tonight. Absolutely perfect show. And uh, Vaughn's uh, website, which the link is below, um, is his Facebook page. So you can reach out to Vaughn over there. And uh, I have a complete list of his books over on jimmychurchradio.com and throughout social media. That's it. This is Thursday night. I'm heading into the weekend. I want everybody to have a great, safe, fun, amazing weekend. And uh, next week, yeah, next week it's going to be all UFOs all night long. That's right. Uh, after the UFO hearing this week and the other breaking news that is going down right now, we are doing UFOs next week on Fade to Black. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Prom, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you, Dennis and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR of the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Everybody have a great, safe weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Go back, Lee Tappy.